so thank you everything that you're doing for the event and making it successful even making us comfortable on this podium right today uh great so um it's it's a great privilege for me to uh, moderate a session with the panelists who bring almost 75 to 90 years of experience together it's a tough job for me and probably we all will do a great job and discuss what the data war looks like uh just to simplify what what we thought is uh, we are going to have some themes to have a discussion and more meaningful and obviously goes without saying when we talk about the enterprise data privacy would be the first thing that comes to our topic but additional to that what sort of uh, influences it brings to startup ecosystem that's where nikhil's expertise will help how enterprises are talking about privacy openness transparency and fair disciplines and principles something that we'll be very keen to hear from shrinivas and of course not to forget how the competitive advantages may turn on either the two sides something bhavna will add and of course great views coming from ava on various aspects we are going to talk about so to get started um uh you know maybe one of the first things i would like to ask and you know ava and shrinivas something for you to share your thoughts it's usually said that privacy is a hindrance to innovation progress uh do you guys agree i mean first of all that's a basic question and if you do so uh how do you think that the progression the economic development and privacy can still be maintained without going on the extreme of the two sides right so do you see it as a hindrance and if so how they can be rightly balanced i will start with you followed by shin was your thoughts thank you manish for this wonderful question and before we get into the question per se if i may just say that the concept of privacy is something which uh, we saw it written in the un document the declaration of human rights but that was back in 1948 which said that any arbitrary inf- interference in family or personal space or privacy per se of an individual is something which is not seen in the positive light which is not allowed and if we just take say few go few years back uh, it was the president roosevelt speech where he says and one of the four uh, factors that he counts he says the the freedom from fear and this fear was not just about uh, you know being the atrocities that were happening then because this was 1941 and we were just emerging from whatever had happened in the world war and thereafter the consistent development where just when the computers came in and when there was this automated processing happening of personal data everybody started talking about oh no there's a threat this threat was how is this personal data how is this data going to be used by the government authorities and this was the german uh, the time when we had those uh, nazis and all that uh, the history recorded so oecd coming up with something fair information practices and all those principles so one thing manish that i very clearly noted is that the principles have remained consistent is the it is the mode and the modality that has changed and why has it changed so let's go back again uh, back to 1948 so if you in your home and if there's this protection within your home which says that nobody there cannot be an interference in your personal space you were safe but we didn't have alexa and siri then who were there in our houses were there in our houses and we don't even know to what extent this data is transmitted and to to who all is recipient of it so this pri- the concept of privacy per se as i see it is an extension of our own personalities now the second path that i come to is back in industrial revolution we were looking for newer markets and that's how the world came to be what it is today the marketing space or the advertising space we were consistently innovating and we consistently had an offering we had product or services and we just wanted to give it to somebody who was willing to buy so then when this digital marketing and targeted advertisement and all of this came up nothing changed except for a fact that where the marketer would go to a consumer identify a consumer from the lot and there was no say means of directly identifying they would identify it and then make that offering from there today we know what your choices are your google knows you more than you know yourself and these this choices these choices have been discovered because there's been innovation in the in the digital world where the modality has changed the fact remains the same now tell me if suppose you knew that uh, there's so many so gps example if i just take that locational uh, data if that could be tracked and there's somebody who's willing to offer a certain service or offer a certain product and if you know that this person is exactly looking for this it optimizes a lot of cost it 
probably would give a lot of benefit to the consumer also. Then we have this whole concept around big data coming in. And now without getting into, you know, naming uh, which brand that was, but a couple of years ago, one of those mobile phone uh, brands came up saying that you do a lot of things with your mobile phones, but we are not aware of it. So technically they said that it was a strategic comp So strat the strategy was privacy was your strategic partnership or you say your when you so that brand sort of positioned that I don't know anything about whatever you're doing while you're doing lot many things with your phone so it was my privacy competition which I sort of played with and then you have a lot of surveys that back up because the customer or the data subject knows that how is my data going to be used which is extension of my personality how do I know that it is not misused it is not used in a sense that I may not be comfortable with. And that led to a lot of development where primary markets of products and uh, services and secondary market of data trade. In this whole context, as, and as I would say, is that there is there's this gap which exists. And the gap is that people understood and this understanding of, see, it's not something which is visible to your naked eyes. It is something which has been perceived over time. And it's only when we saw, so there was this uh, discussion that I was happening with, having with somebody and, and it was the same time that one of our major hospitals were held for uh, ransom. The data was held for ransom. And those who told me, how does it even matter? You share your data and in the end you're benefiting because somebody else is able to customize things according to your need. Now the question was, Somebody has got into some hospital and they're just going to change the blood group from A to B and you try that and you see the consequences of it. And that's how people have started perceiving and understanding what privacy is. Now for the companies, in terms of innovation or in terms of, they, they know that the cost of uh, being or cost of being, I would not say compliant, but respecting the rights or respecting the data that they, that they uh, collect it's important because there's a cost if there's a breach. On the other side, if this is if this is not very well handled or not very well maintained, I think for a short run, it could be great unless the regulator catch up or a breach happens. And then you see what cost could be. And if there is this complement that could be drawn between uh, how much, uh, what would be the cost if the data, the right or the personality of your consumer per se is respected versus what happens when it is not respected. Now these two, now what the debate Manish today is with GDPR coming in and you know there's so much of skepticism where we keep talking about uh, this is sort of stifled innovation, this is sort of, uh, this is not good for the economy, this will kill uh, innovation, this will kill uh, progress of economic growth. The thing is that there's this three subjects that I personally feel. The concept of under regulation. We've got regulations but they're not translated, they're not implemented. Then we've got over-regulation. So an over-regulation is not so right because you're trying to give, so if, we, if we just take an example where you say consent and consent based and you know, in this informational, uh, you know, this uh, landscape, we're trying to say that the data subject is empowered enough and this data subject will choose how their you know, right is, uh, how, how they excise and how the data is being used. I might, if I may just ask one question here. How many of us have read the privacy notice of all the applications with whom we have shared our data? How many of us exactly know how many applications have our data? And yet another survey which says that if you were to read, so there were 14 applications that were studied and Microsoft application apparently was the most, uh, uh, most comprehensive one. And you know the time that it would take to read that notice? Just the time that you'd read that you would take to read Macbeth, which is about one to two hours. Can you spend that that amount of time reading that? Is your data subject really really <coughs> empowered? Lastly, we are regulating the wrong subjects. Wrong regulations for wrong subject. We say it is consent based. You're empowered, and for all the reason that I'm telling you how empowered you are. But at the same time, what is happening in the big data world? So you've got. There's no consent, the data is aggregated, data is collected, and this data is processed. And then, based on this data, there's a decision made, because all decisions are data-driven. So you've got a decision made, and this decision is going to affect somebody, and this is off that lot, but then they do not have a right because this data has been anonymized. Yep. How right is this? Yep. So somewhere there's a balance that needs to be exactly. drawn. And thank you. Thank and I you. think that's where I said that is, are the, if there are the two extreme ends, how do we draw the right comparison? Shinwas, any any thoughts? If there are, 
how we still continue to innovate but at the same time respect the privacy yeah i think uh, many points sabha covered uh, i fully agree uh, that we have to make it happen where by uh, we respect privacy at the same time embrace innovation uh, there is no question of any second thoughts on which one is more important um, and as engineers privacy engineers our role would be to uh, make it a positive sum game and there are ways to do it a number of ways we in the ground do it actually um the the set of measures that are required are are multiple uh, so i would not like to cover all of them many of you would know gdpr and many regulations specify them so we would require a right set of measures which are both uh, procedural measures safeguards as well as use of privacy enhancing technologies uh, and all this we call the methodology that we often use is called privacy by design uh, people uh, need to have privacy engineers who work Uh, who understand how the technology works how the data flows in order to see that at the um, very root they address this problem of how we can implement minimization how do we structure the data collection under various buckets for instance what we have um, in in gdpr we have what is called article 6 in india uh, is also there i think it's article 5 if i remember uh, in the draft bill Uh, which talks about uh, you have to determine what is the legal basis so that legal determination of uh, collection of the data is uh, it could be varied right it could be consent it could be non consent non consent has to be in uh, under performance of contract legitimate interest but the important thing there is the consent part uh, whatever data is not required to be collected for the purpose of uh, uh, or which is required for big data use cases etc or for ai must be put under consent where the uh, citizen or the consumer is empowered the idea is privacy is about people and people need to be empowered to make choices about how their data is getting processed what data is collected how their decisional autonomy is going to impact impacted for that uh, it's very important to give choices to people there are times when we are okay to share data and make it usable for certain purpose and there are other times we don't want to and that cannot be decided by some company or by some government entity it has to be by the consumer and the role that we engineers play when we design platforms is to make the distinction to see that those data which are required uh, uh, mandatorily there is no choice element because privacy is not an absolute right it is a legitimate interest there are times when there are based on choice and those must be put into different bucket <coughs> thanks for that and and that would be the approach we can talk a lot of all it on but it can go endless i'm sure and and that also reminds me that early we used to uh, early on when cyber security started there used to be a question is cyber security an extreme of uh, user friendliness but in today's world i think they both have to go together right because even if it adds to a difficulty for user experience but the cyber security can't be compromised i think that's what we have to find the right move nikhil i think you have some points yeah, to make yeah just wanted to jump in on this debate you know it, i think it was maybe 3 or 4 years ago that there an article by nandan nilikani where he talked about india becoming a data rich country first before it becomes an economically rich country um and we are a poor country no bones about it we are the 1% over here uh, for me this is a false choice between innovation and privacy um, and we've seen it every time in every government document starting from the shri krishna committee report which perpetrated this false choice um, what we are facing right now and simple numbers right not vpn put out a report i think about a, a, a couple of weeks ago that said that the price of the digital identity and profile information of an indian citizen on the dark web is 490 rupees per person um what we tend to ignore is that data is a toxic asset it's like nuclear waste more than oil the cost of of losing your data the harm that can be caused to an individual and we've seen this with all the upi scams that happen is far greater than the benefit of having that data out there uh startups and businesses often collect more information than they actually need about an individual which is why what's missing in the data protection bill is purpose limitation um and there's deemed consent all of this is in order to encourage economic activity but what we are facing right now is a global market failure in privacy where across the globe our data is being collected we are being profiled is being targeted we are being targeted it's being used against us to our detriment data protection laws the primary purpose is to enhance our privacy so that the most important thing if you run a business the most important thing in business is trust 
today you give your data away without realizing the harms the moment you're aware of the harms you will not trust that business so it's not a choice between innovation and privacy i'm saying, my point is privacy is inherent to innovation is inherent to business is inherent to growth you can't have growth without trust absolutely i think it's a it's a great point to make and it has to be embedded i think that's really the philosophy goes there thank you so much uh, we are a bit uh, you know running late but uh, we'll quickly make the progress and uh, we spoke about the harm to an individual as nikhil said bhavna and maybe i'll come to you to to understand your thoughts that today we are a very fast digitally progressing economy and digitally means digital data what is your thought when it comes about privacy as a requirement from a competition law perspective and how advantageous or reverse side it could be when you look from competition perspective they can give a perspective of uh, impact to an individual but in to hear your thoughts to how the enterprises may look at it as a price war sorry privacy war from a competition perspective thank you so much for the question manish and uh, i'm so grateful to hear the views of you know the corporates and you know of uh, nikhil's views and that makes my task a little bit easy because at least theoretically we all agree that privacy is an important parameter of competition between enterprises and consumers when you know they are choosing which enterprise they should be using for a particular purpose they are concerned about how their data is you know secured and obviously this is a very difficult question and you know there there has been a lot of divide not just in india but across the globe whether privacy can be seen under competition law and whether it is raising any competition concerns or not and there is a school of thought which says that privacy itself is a non economic matter and you know the competition authorities should not at all be concerned about the privacy issues and there are other authorities which can very well look into it and but again there is another school of thought which is gaining a lot of traction again across the globe within competition authorities in some of the mature jurisdictions also that privacy is a competition issue because it is part of that economic bargain that is struck between the service provider and the users so when i am using the services of a platform i should be given a choice to choose between two competitors and quality can be one of the parameters where privacy is a part of that quality decision so even if it is a non economic matter even if you know many of the platforms are providing zero price products so many of the platforms which we use which we think are zero priced because we are not paying any monetary price to it but then we all know that data is the price that you give every time you visit a platform and if one is you know if one looks at it like that i know that an average consumer may not be one aware and second concerned you know how much data you share but as the owners of our data we have a right to know the extent the scope and the purpose for which the data has been collected and if i can talk about one of the cases which the competition commission of india is looking at although right now the case is still under examination but i can still talk from the prima facie observations which the commission had which led to the detailed investigation it was the whatsapp privacy policy matter so in sometime in 2021 we all know we have been using whatsapp whatsapp is something which i think everyone in this country is using and it is only some very sophisticated people at least just two three people i know who do not really want to have any digital footprints they are the ones who are not using smartphones otherwise even the rickshaw walas they using smartphones and they using whatsapp and the whatsapp privacy policy that came in 2021 it said that a consumer has a choice you can choose to be the user of whatsapp but then you have to accept the privacy uh, the data sharing policy wherein whatsapp will be sharing your data with other facebook company now the meta so with other facebook companies they'll be sharing your data and yes of course whatsapp very rightly you know one of the arguments was that it gives you a choice but is that really a choice not to use whatsapp or to use whatsapp it is not a choice whatsapp being a dominant instant messaging app you know we really do not have a choice not to use whatsapp and then they said that you either take it or leave it so the earlier whatsapp policy said that you have an option you know you still can choose not to share not to let whatsapp share your data with other other entities but you can still you know continue using whatsapp but the new privacy policy that came in 2021 of january it said that 
you have to allow WhatsApp to share your data and integrate your data with Facebook. And I will not really go into that question of how that data can be misused, but the very fact that you're using WhatsApp for a very particular purpose for connecting with your friends, your family, for work, for group calls, for sharing images and other things, and that data, if it can be integrated with Facebook, how it can be monetized and how it can be used. We honestly, at least I honestly, do not have a clue how, you know, what all can be done with that data. So how it becomes a competition issue? Well, as owners of our own data, we have sovereign rights to know the extent, to know the exact extent, the scope, and the purpose for which the data is used. So if you go in a shop and you're buying a shirt or you're buying anything for that purpose, and if the price tag does not really tell you what price you're paying for it. So for example, if it says, this shirt is something around from 500 to 1000, the price can be anything. Will you really buy that shirt? The answer is no. You would want to know with certainty how much price you have to pay for a shirt. And this is only a range of 500 rupees. You know, it is not such a big range that one has to choose from. But when it comes to data, the policy which we looked at, the WhatsApp policy, there were so much, in, so much, you know, vagueness, ambiguity, and although it says that the consumer has a choice, but as Abha pointed out, that you need some two, three hours to read that. And even if you read that, whether you understand that or not, it is not really sure. So there were terms in the policy like such as includes, you know, so nothing is certain, for example, so nothing is certain how much data cost you're paying for using WhatsApp and how that data will be used. So one of the things that the commission, that the competition commission looked at is that the cost which the consumer has to pay for that service, it is not clear. So it is a kind of an exploitative harm to the consumer. Second is that the kind of policies have one has, if a consumer see it as a parameter of quality competition, then obviously it was leading to consumer detriment. And of course, third, you know, if, if one is having a lot of data and that data is being used to one's own advantage, then obviously it can give you a competitive edge over your competitors, which is not bad in that particular line because when we talk about economic actors, of course, you should fairly compete and you should become big. But the moment you start using that bigness to the harm to the consumer and to your own advantage, it does become a competition harm. Yeah, so and that and would be my short answer to. No, absolutely. I think it <coughs> it helps to <coughs> relate the connections of privacy and competition law. But but as a mitigation to it and to ensure that the monopolistic uh, you know advantages are not taken, do you believe rights of data portability as a means? We won't go into the practicality details. But if I as a consumer have an option of porting my data. Will that be a way of saying that the, the competition monopoly can be still maintained and I as a user have still have an option of going to? Yeah, I think portability is one way of seeing it. We but again, you know, we also have to create a lot of awareness and education for the consumers to actually know how their data is can used. be used and misused Absolutely. and how they can safeguard against Absolutely. all right. those things. So, right without having the proper knowledge. So I, I think all of us have seen the data protection bill. It talks a lot about consent. It talks about notice. But just giving notice and taking consent, you know, I'm sure even the most sophisticated ones will not be really able to give their informed consent sure. to all the apps that they're using. Thanks for that. Uh, Abha, any one minute uh, commentary on, on this? If I may share. So, uh, privacy and competition law. And as we see it in competition, I completely agree. Driven by fair market forces, absolutely perfect. Now, the thing is this. What was the incentive for Facebook to grow this big? What was the incentive for Google? Who knew Android back in 2005? Nobody. And if this data which is collected is not appropriately understood, do you think we'll have the product offerings? We're talking about WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, all of these. But Tell me, don't we have substitutes to WhatsApp? We have Signal, we have Telegram. What is lacking and why is, it what's, why is WhatsApp so big? It's because they have understood what the customer wants. In the end, the, the objective of competition law 
consumer welfare, welfare acts and privacy law. It's just the same, to give the best that the customer would want to choose. Now, if I have to make, so these organizations who are consistently harvesting data are also yeah. using it in a certain form. Let's go to DMA in Europe. All these platforms, the e-commerce platforms, have been restrained after a certain threshold from sharing this data to somebody else. This data will go where? Line a warehouse? Right. And you think the customer would eventually be benefited out of this data lying in the warehouse? Isn't it killing innovation? And lastly, on the IPR, now another subject, on IPR, we said if you make that investment, you get, you have the right to patent. Your trade secrets are protected. But here, where is that incentive? So we have to be mindful of the fact that we are crafting a balance between all these consumer welfares. One shouldn't be overlapping, getting into any other. And that also brings me to very important concept. And this is something which is happening in, uh, in the court right now in the same matter. On one hand, we have the competition authorities who say that I have a right to investigate. Fair enough, please do it. But then do you, do you, do you also have the privacy uh, bodies who would say that this was allowed or this was not allowed? So if technically taken a corporate to a stance where they did what technically is allowed by the law of that land, it is not illegal. But then you have, a comp you have another regulator who's saying, no, I am going to investigate into this subject and figure out that you've abused, a dom abused your position. And uh, forgive me for saying that just in case if that is the uh, verdict. To say you've abused your position and the consumer is some, which consumer who has substitutes, which consumer who was voluntarily chosen to be on WhatsApp because WhatsApp had be better offerings. Now there was uh, this, uh, uh, rep, this, um, uh, this, thing which was given by uh, one of the parliamentary committee report, 172nd uh, parliamentary committee report, which said that it's very important that you have one regulatory body. Because today in consumer welfare and precisely in India, we have about three or three plus bodies. And when all of them start investigating the same subject, there are gaps, there are overlaps. And this is not in the best interest of why corporates should be there in India offering a product of services. So I think it's a balance that needs to be drawn. It's not, a comp like, it's not about which is right, which is wrong. It's about there has to be a proportionate balance, which should be in the interest of the consum consumer, which is eventually what all these laws aim by. Thank you. And of course, the point about making the consumer themselves be aware as to what they're getting into. Uh, Can I give a short response to it? Please. I'm, the, I'm a little the, tempted. The dialogue is in front of us. It's up to yeah. us to decide which yeah. offer, what it is. So, just a very, very short response. One is that, of course, there are substitutes to WhatsApp which are offering the same service, but they do not have the same network. So ju just me moving to and substitute does not really help me connect with you and others who are still using WhatsApp. Second, WhatsApp did not come with such a policy when it had started. It came up with the policy when it had already became dominant and when the market had already tipped in its favor. And once the market tips, and we all know that these are all network industries and they are useful. Facebook is Facebook because of the users it has. You know, it's not in the name that I'm fascinated with Facebook or WhatsApp. So you have such a big network and you started with very humble and you know, very benign policies. Okay, you want to share your data or you don't want to share your data, you can still continue using WhatsApp. But in 2021, when you became dominant, then you came up with policies where although you have given me an option, you know, to choose it or not to choose it, but that option, I really do not see it as an option where there are substitutes which are as potent, not even, I would put into still a strong word, not even as close, you know, where WhatsApp is. Maybe, maybe moving on uh, from this WhatsApp debate uh, and coming back to the core. Uh, 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 Srinivas, uh, your thoughts, uh, we heard both Bhavna and Ahaba talking about fairness. And there are also synonyms of openness, transparency. And with your extreme experience, how do you think these aspects of privacy, openness, transparency can be best handled? Are there some examples that you would have to share to ensure that the world has better still maintained and, and the principles are still taken care of? Your thoughts on that? Sir? Yeah, uh, fairness is a very difficult subject <laughs> because it is uh, very subjective. Absolutely. And it's beyond the <coughs> privacy world, uh, I would say. Uh, although uh, GDPR does touch and some regulations are staying away from it and leaving it to for peripheral laws to define what is fair, like insurance companies, maybe health sector. 
they need to come up with. But definitely, and maybe a lot on dependence on precedences of courts, which we hear from particularly Article 29 Working Party, uh, EDPB in Europe. So uh, on the openness and transparency, yeah, I think openness, uh, which is the same as transparency, um, consent, which is choice, and accountability. These three are the bedrock of uh, privacy because uh, on that is where we rely, uh, consumer relies on, uh, and they're very fundamental. Uh, if you see uh, the technology world today uh, relies uh, on data, right? More the data, more meaningful inferences companies can draw about people. Uh, and and uh, some of them are beneficial, some use cases are harmful. It depends on uh, the nature of data, the, the context. Uh, in, a, in the physical world, uh, we control ourselves on what information we share with people by, by not getting into places um, and uh, the attire we have, uh, what we reveal to people, the, the, uh, the, the situational context. So all that is completely controlled. But in the digital world, the same is compromised because of the ability to glean data about me without my knowledge, most of it without my knowledge. And sometimes with my knowledge, but with no choice. Uh, and that's what uh, causes a huge asymmetry between a consumer and these corporations which uh, used the latest technologies, which consumers are uh, far away from uh, in understanding. For instance, you I think some examples came up. You go to a shop, the, 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 the shopkeeper or the, the, the retail store recognizes you. Uh, maybe they don't know your name, but they know what you purchased yesterday. <laughs> What your, what your interests are and imagine that uh, through facial recognition they are recognizing you and they maybe they tell your name if not at least they say that hey welcome back and yesterday we purchased this uh, we have new stock and let's go to the upper floor and that puts you into an embarrassment situation because you are now uh, that day you came alone today you are with someone who whom you don't want to, to know about what purchases you made that day and the choices are being made same thing can happen in a laptop, right? In the, in the, so that in the physical world, you would be very careful not to let people know. And, and even the decisions, when I spoke about decisional autonomy, the, the price you pay for is often not fixed. Both in the digital world and physical world, right? The, the, the way people respond to you, um, the interactions that you have with people, uh, you, you know what, uh, how you want to yourself to be perceived as. And depending on that, you dress yourself, you express yourself, you reveal selectively about your identity, your background, all that stuff. But in the digital world, these are all gone because the, the ability to glean information from various sources is increasing. And that would be used in unknowing ways where the, to draw inferences, including price decisions. Imagine you're going to, per, the entire purchase history is known, your status is known. Uh, when you log into a portal, what he sees the price, I see a price of a hotel or a ticket would be different. Uh, sometimes, not just that, sometimes the same Shrini is going again and again, uh, the price goes up. Why? Because the, 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 the guy on the other side, the retail store, has figured out how desperate I am. The desperation is a very important attribute of mine. I don't want you guys to know my desperation. I don't want you to know that I'm desperate for a job, desperate to fly tonight. I don't want Uber to know that I'm desperate to take a cab now because it's rainy day on a Friday evening and my remaining battery power attribute in the mobile phone, let's say Uber or any company for that matter, has captured and they figured out that it's only 2%. So the price can go up. Would you allow that? Technologically, it's fine. Economically, it's fine. There is no law in our constitution which prevents this. So where is the problem? It, anything which makes business sense and which is not blacklisted by law, it's fine. Right? So would you allow all these things? So these are all comes to the question of fairness. Yep. But the way we have to handle is, I think, uh, uh, and we spoke about that innovation case also, it's welcome to have innovation, but while embracing innovation, we must adopt safeguards to see that what is permissible and what is not. B, to uh, give choice where possible, if not, be transparent. So if here, if you're transparent, I know, okay, I need to carry one more mobile phone where the battery is more, or I will, back on my friend to take a cab or I will take public transport but I'll not become a victim of what That's I am situation. maybe I'll yeah uh, in buying up a ticket I may use a different device to see that my I'm not tracked to figure out that my desperation so we will find out ways to to circumvent uh, the the better understanding that prevails on the other side and that choice nobody can snatch me in the digital world from me 
so that's what i think the 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 regulations have to make these organizations accountable to respect the choices made by people and to see that they don't invade into your privacy to the extent where your decisional autonomy is gone you are victim of the digital avatar on the other side right so examples are plethora of course we we when we uh, you saw even the clear view breach which happened recently that uh, we used to think that data which is there in the public domain is free anybody can do anything with that right although article 14 in gdpr insists that when you collect data from about people not from the people then you need to inform them as soon as possible or or reach out to them and give them a choice at least opt out choice now uh, we used to think that data which is in the public domain is free but look at the clear view breach it clearly if you read the judgment by several regulators in europe it says just because data is lying there you are not supposed to use it in ways which are which are intruding into privacy right biometric so so uh, the clear message is that anything freely available doesn't mean that you can invade without the permission without consent without informing them so we we are going into a, a, a space where there is going to be increased tiff uh, between regulators and the innovators on the other side so the balancing we must do i think is uh, plenty of examples let's say you take example of let you are using ai to interview people uh, you don't want to interview 10000 people uh, physically so you put the data into res resume analyzer parsers so all that stuff similarly workplace analytics a uh, lot of companies today are asking from work from home in that companies are selling technologies which which uh, uh, monitor people remotely for a couple of reasons one is about productivity the other is about are they leaking some data are they taking pictures now those are very invading because they expect you to put the camera on yes, completely awesome. which is intruding into privacy so there um, uh, uh, we need again innovation to balance uh, to see that people are aware because when people are made aware they know that uh, that how do you behave in front of the camera in a manner which you would like them to know now that is okay for a, maybe one hour interview one hour exam but the same thing is not okay if you continuously monitor for 9 hours right. because you you then lose your identity actually you start behaving uh, what the other guy wants you to behave like even at workplace you don't want to lose your own identity of the way you are free to type free to code maybe you are very innovative you just type for 5 minutes take up coffee break and come back that's my style her style is different right so everybody's style is different and nobody wants us to completely analyze ourselves to figure out how much productive we are based on what their measurement system is so so all that uh, uh, requires us to be transparent and uh, choices are difficult in certain cases but the previous examples choices are important and uh, then wherever possible use privacy enhancing technologies to minimize or pseudonymize the data so these are summary of what i would say in the interest of time yeah. no thank you so much uh, i have you know just to humor the situation i'm tempted to ask so the first thing to remember is that startups really 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 care about data awesome um what happens is that when you're starting up you have uh, you still don't know who your customer is you don't know what your product should be you try a hundred different things and your decisions are largely based on the data of how users are using the service that you're providing or the product that you're creating including apps so if someone's clicking on a particular tab a lot more and you find more users are use, clicking on that tab a lot more that might actually end up being a eventual product i know startups that have started off with 15 different features and then killed 14 of them and become a single feature product right so data is critical to how we innovate um and it's essential for us to uh, as as startups to try and in, figure out what works for us and what consumers want on the basis of what data we collect the other important aspect of data is in in marketing you know there's a old advertising saying that 50% of my marketing spends are going waste the problem is i don't know which 50% so when you look at profiling when you look at targeting all of this is in order to increase the probability of success if i run three different ads i see which one performs better so i run experiments and then i pick the one that works most because my cost of running that ad is lowest as a startup so startups really care about data what they what they don't think about is what consumers think about that data that they are collecting so they start up invariably try and collect as much data as possible more than they need because they need to make decisions and they don't know what data will be useful for what decision 
they feel they own the data. And there is, if you look at regulation, ownership of data is never determined. If you look at in India, in the, in the data protection bill, businesses are data fiduciaries, not, not data owners. Consumers, the ownership, whether a consumer owns their own data, whether you and, and I own our own data is not been deci decided because of one single simple problem. Most data, when you use a service, is co-created. How you use a particular service, where you click, it's co-created with the service that you're using. So it's an undecided question. It's a difficult question to answer. What is decided is, or what we hope will be decided because it's not in the current version of the bill, is uh, what Chini referred to repeatedly as decisional autonomy of an individual, which translates into uh, if you look at the Supreme Court verdict on the right to privacy, informational self-determination. You decide what happens with the information. You want to port it, you port it. You want to delete it, you delete it. Unfortunately, the data protection bill doesn't give the right to erasure, which is great for startups because then they don't, they, they will not lose a certain entire set of data points where every user starts removing their data. But in the longer run, it is problematic because it creates, like I mentioned earlier, a situation of distrust. Trust is a very important factor for all businesses, including startups. When, so I, I remember a conversation, we did a roundtable discussion with, on cloud with, uh, with startups in Bangalore about four or five years ago. And we were talking about cybersecurity. And it was Chatham House, no one identified. And everyone started telling their war stories of ransomware attacks, of data being stolen, of mistakes they've made. These mistakes happen. How many of them reported those mistakes? None. So, if you don't give me the right to know as an individual, I'm talking about not as a startup but as a person, if you don't give me the right to know where my data is stored, like the current data protection bill in, has deemed consent, it also doesn't have notice for deemed consent. Right? I don't know how to hold you accountable because I don't even know that you have my data in many cases. Uh, if I know that you have my data, then I should have the right to know what you have. I should have the right to get it removed. I should have the right to port it to the extent possible. That's also missing from the bill. So as, as, a, as a business, as a startup, I understand the importance of collecting data, of using the data to growth, to finding, figuring out what works for people. But as a consumer, I'm extremely worried because what I'm being robbed of to quite an extent is not just the in a complicated notice the ability to know what is uh, what is being collected of me and for what purpose it is limited but it's also currently purpose limitation itself is more or less removed from the bill so I don't have the right and therefore I don't know whom to trust and to some extent many of us will stop using certain services if we can't trust them if you see most of WhatsApp's advertising it focuses on talking about security and privacy because they're using the uh, the open signal protocol which is highly stress tested and recognized as being the most secure end to end uh, way of means of encryption so i trust it on the privacy policy front which we were discussing i just want to come in on a minute i'm i just find it very difficult to digest that even as a dominant player if i'm not doing any harm why am i not allowed to change my terms and give people the opportunity to use it in the future or not. If they don't want to use it, network, net, network effects might hold me in. And so we need to address issues related to network effects and create opportunities for people to make a choice to be able to port to something else. We need to address issues of dominance. But asking people to choose on a privacy policy, I don't, somehow I can't wrap my head around that being abuse of dominance. You're giving people a choice. Uh, if they and, and and so this I think this this issue of 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 uh, of dominance abuse of dominance network effects and how the data economy works this needs a lot more exploration we can't quite say that you know uh, that we are the owners of our data because that question still not been decided awesome. well, thanks for that and it's great to hear from you that startups care about data and they appreciate the fact that the data is used for the businesses as well as for the Privacy is it? Yeah, but they care about the data for their own, but may not consider the, the privacy or the consumer part of the equation, right? So, but, but thanks for that. Uh, 
we, we have more questions, but I think uh, we are left with almost no time. But I would happen to open the forum in case anybody has any question, remarks, and thoughts. Uh, you know, another minute or so, uh, panelists will be happy to answer. Please. Can we get the mic to them? Would we actually take a quick round of questions? It might be easier because of that. So sorry. Would we just take four or five questions together and see if there's an overlap? Yeah, if, if there's an overlap, absolutely. So uh, let us hear the questions. Yeah, please. we had a uh, great panel discussion. Thank you for all the insights. We had contrasting views. It was really great. Um, so a very fundamental question is businesses are used to processing data the way they like. Now with purpose limitation, how do we control, that is how does regulation or the entities control themselves that they don't use it beyond the consent, which is a very tricky challenge. Like with, with AI, you don't even know what it is learning. Um, we are just beginning to speak about ethical AI, uh, right? So how do you ensure that the businesses don't use data beyond the purpose and what are the initiatives we are taking in that direction. Okay. Uh, any any other question? Yeah. So we will we'll do a quick uh, question collection and then maybe the panelists can answer that. Please. Uh, I have made okay. I made certain notes on on that. Since 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 we are moving from price based economy to data driven economy, since we are moving from price based economy to data driven economy, uh, data monetization is a part of it, right? So uh, my my question goes like this that uh, what to an extent the promise of data security or protection play a role in getting the informed consent on privacy uh, for data monetization? Okay, can you give some example? What do you mean? Informed consent like, for data monetization? Yes, like, uh, like WhatsApp promises that there is a uh, end-to-end uh, encryption of the messages, yeah. right? But what if the uh, information on on the user, it, it starts monetizing for you know some some other purpose like for uh, payment apps and all okay that goes back to the point that he's asking that if the data has been created for a defined purposes how do you ensure it is contained and not going beyond right okay <coughs> we'll come to that any other question yeah hey uh, a very very uh, nice views very elaborate views on privacy ethics competition uh, we know the work which competition commission of india has done and uh, uh, google's uh, anti marketing policies and uh, against competition. See, uh, uh, point is that data owners, do, so question is, do the data owners know what is their data about? Uh, give an example, your one fingerprint authentication creates a 110 column data. Would you like to know? Would you like to know that much data? Would you like to have consent that much pinpointed? Second, uh, there are a lot of data fiduciaries today in India. Would a unification solve a purpose? Would it stifle innovation? When we talk about corporates, would you like those silos be maintained to maintain the privacy? And how much privacy, uh, is there a quantitative measure or a qualitative measure? Would you like your privacy to be rated four among five? Would you give uh, separated consents for each? And do a normal consumer has time to give consent for everything? So there has to be an answer that uh, would you like so many data fiduciaries? Uh, why I'm asking these questions? Uh, I come from UIDI, I come from armed forces, I handle fraud analytics, I know what Media Nama does. There are a lot of things which we answer. Uh, privacy came and law came because of uh, Aadhaar Act coming into play. Uh, 1400 some pages of Putta Swami judgment we know. So, there are many things which are working uh, behind the government. So it's very easy to say that privacy uh, has to be preserved. Yes, it has to be preserved. But how many of us sitting even in this panel know, uh, like, like somebody said that, do you really know where your data lies? So if even you know, do you have a single platform? Would you like your life to be controlled that you are giving consent in a day for many things? Uh, another related question is, uh, there was a Domino's pizza leak some seven days back, uh, some seven years back. And I, even I was astonished that a, a pizza order which I gave in 2010 was also there on my number there. So does it really harms me now? Does it, is, is, is something troubling me now? No, it didn't trouble me at all. That I ordered a pizza in 2010, it was there on the leak. So this, this minute, uh, fine grained consent would, is it in the interest of the economy? Is it interest in the interest of the uh, normal consumers? 
So these are some points I think. Uh, sure. So I think you, yeah. you, you gave a quite a good perspective, but I think one of the questions which is very concrete is that is consent going to be taxing? If there have to be multiple, I think that's really the takeaway. Yeah, one last question uh, because we have been notified about the yeah. notice. So I have a very simple question. So we spoke about the length of privacy notices. So even if we make a very generic privacy notice or a very small privacy notice, how can a business ever know that the consumer is actually aware of what they have just uh, accepted? That, that, that is my question. I'm not even sure whether they want to. If they are willing, <laughs> exactly. if they are yeah. accepted, how that's not yeah. their problem. Yeah. How can the yeah, business know that the consumer it is, is aware. better for the businesses that yeah. the consumer does not. What, what matters to them is that whether the click button of acceptance has been there or not. But uh, there will be very very few uh, secret companies who may be interested to whether they are not accepted. Really, the last question, please, to start. Yeah. I can start. Yes. So uh, simple that you need to have a. If you're talking about how. Uh, we have to, uh, in, in example, in GDPR, there is Article 30. We have in other clause also, uh, which is about record keeping the, the, the entire inventory of data with, for each processing, what data you collect for what purpose. That needs to be uh, restricted. And you must see that if you're using for any other purpose, you need, unless it is in, uh, compatible, in which case it's fine. If not, you need to go back to the consumer and check what is the purpose and, and take their approval unless the purpose is legitimate uh, and is part of the notice. So the, the purpose restriction must is a very, very important aspect of data privacy and it must be maintained. So that's how it is done. Uh, now people may connive with some other company and do and things that's a different matter. I'll not get into that aspect. So I'm assuming that the management's intent is to safeguard privacy in this case, in which case this is the method to be used. And coming to the aspect of uh, Measurement, I think one of you said privacy measurement, uh, privacy, how do you uh, ch choice, notice. So I think the privacy notice, a lot of it wouldn't be waited. I'm trying to club the answer. Yeah. So privacy notices has to be comprehensive enough, but not so complicated that people cannot take decision. So um, particularly when choice comes. So that's why we say that a privacy notice, which is a subset of consent, must be uh, such that the, there's an informed consent, which is you are able to take decisions. That means information which is not too much, which is not too less. So th and that much has to be context based. It cannot be generalized. Uh, and uh, regarding measurement, there is no measurement on privacy. Um, like there is no measurement for security as well, right? It's two decades. We don't have any measure on data security. On privacy, however, the several international bodies have defined, like you have CIA paradigm in security. We have uh, three attributes which are commonly used. They are transparency, intervenability, and unlinkability. These three dimensions are universally today used to say what is the degree of privacy. There is no one number, but on this scale, CII triad and these three are together used to say that when we in privacy be designed to say that how much, how well the privacy is preserved. And the question of the gentleman asked, I think about from UIDA, you said, uh, of course, Nikhil will answer, but uh, and, and one more gentleman at the end asked, yes, privacy is context based. There is uh, uh, privacy for each of us is different. And that is the reason which I mentioned in my previous uh, 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 response that uh, privacy is not something which a company decides about you or the government law tells about it. The laws don't prescribe how much privacy is needed. It is just saying that it is for citizens, it's for consumers, and they need to be empowered, informed about what the, how the information collection practices are going to be. And here I want to con add to what Nikhil said that a privacy <coughs> notice is a must. Whether it's deemed consent, consent, whichever method, notice there is no substitute except for very few law enforcement areas, which is very limited probably for investigation cases. Universally, it is notice is a must. And the other part is that since you have to be empowered, it has to be such that your your choice is come, uh, uh, you exercise. And the, the entity which is collecting, whether it is a government entity or private entity, has to be made accountable to see that the choices you made are okay. adhered to, respected, and they are made accountable. So that accountability principle ties along with all other principles. Without that, you cannot uh, hold anybody, uh, you cannot enforce the data privacy law. You can add. I'll, I'll just quickly add to what Sweeney said. Um, on the notice part, there is a, and everyone likes to uh, go after noticing it's useless. There has to be a UX, user experience revolution in notice globally. Just because it's difficult to pass, just because it's only written by lawyers who have to basically cover their ass and write everything that they can to protect themselves and the companies that they represent, doesn't mean that you can't improve on it. There can be levels at which you so notice where 
you can have an aggregate level which is more user friendly you can have more, more detail give users a choice of reading which notice and all notices that they want to that doesn't mean you do away with notice a lot of people use also this particular angle to say consent is pointless <coughs> let's just regulate for harms we should not forget that the consent is your right to say no your choice of not giving consent still exists your your choice of not clicking i agree still exists what it means is if i do not click i agree then someone can't process my data someone can't collect my data look we know that for example for many of us uidai forced us to give consent government orders plma rules all of that it we were forced to give consent that consent is meaningless you're basically forcibly taking my data you're forcing me to get an aadhaar number all of this has happened right because there is a statutory right at least with companies we should have the right to not give our consent you know i mean effectively statutorily even it should apply to governments but i guess that ship has sailed unfortunately any any uh, perspectives on the question that was made that is consent or multiple consent going to be taxing right and and i i understand there is a concept of a consent manager which is likely to you know consolidate but but the point is still valid that if for everything that i have to leverage do i have to keep on giving consent every day not required will, will that be taxing that's right that's yeah. right so as mentioning that consent fatigue gets introduced then one is about informed consent that is exact amount of information the other is uh, where the information which doesn't help data subject take a decision or it's unnecessary we should keep it out and instead shift to accountability so consent is and accountability are not two sides of the coin both are required so consent consent is not at all a substitute for accountability a lot of companies think that consent le liya to you know uh, i can do anything so consent is not this very very limited functionality it has it doesn't uh, remove you from absolve you from accountability so accountability is where you can fix that this was disproportionate you shared this with another company like you can for example facebook was charged for sharing data with cambridge analytica right why so the consent is meaningless there it's disproportionate uh, sharing sorry you want not exactly on this but i just wanted to give two minutes thoughts if you know i'm okay as long as uh, the audience are okay and the organizers yeah because okay. somebody in the audience i think uh, the person from uidai he said that dominos tracking the data of me ordering a pizza in 2010 does not really create a problem and i just wanted to speak from the uh, competition authorities perspective but these are my personal views i'm attending this in personal capacity that data itself is not a problem and we all know that there are digital platforms who are competing for how much data they have and obviously you know if i am ordering a coffee every day from a food delivery app whether it is zomato or swiggy i would really want them i would not mind if they give me a pop up saying that do you want to order one large coffee from starbucks again today you know it really saves my time it saves my efforts and i can just in one click i can order that coffee and that is really not a problem that is a good use of data you know you are tailoring choices and you are customizing my data for my own advantage for me saving my time the problem arises when zomato or swiggy or any other food delivery app has that consistent data on a daily basis of what i am eating what time i of the day i am ordering what are my food preferences and then they try to enter in the downstream market and compete with the business users so every platform has two sets of consumers or multiple set of sets of consumers there is a consumer side who's only ordering who's very happy with a tailor made choice coming to me not spending my time even sitting in a meeting i can order a coffee but then there is a business side starbucks or other coffee houses which are competing for that space who will sell that coffee to me and then there is zomato swiggy or any other food delivery app who knows what i am trying to look for who has a lot of control about which logistic partner will be allocated to which service provider and when we are making decisions you know you take a decision based on what price each coffee seller is offering you in what time it will be delivered and there are many other parameters which can be in strict control of that platform so the problem begins when that the data is being used Uh, in a way where you do not operate as a neutral platform and as a platform if the platform neutrality is lost that is the end of competition and you know from there we come and just to add what you said does imagine the data being shared with the insurance company 
health insurance company which starts tracking uh, your uh, dietary habits and increase the premium of insurance. Now, is that good? We come to the fairness point, right? So, the business will argue it is good because the, even healthy people will argue it's good because their premium comes down. The unhealthy people's premium goes up. I'm unhealthy, let's say. I know I'm, I'm that uh, rich cheese layer. Said. So, I, I, but I would like to know that in advance. So, I'll also control my diet. Give me choice. Let's all be in one platform. It should not be an un, unbiased, you know, asymmetry should not be there. So, that's the point. <laughs> Side. There's a concept in data protection, at least in again in the context of Aadhaar that we talk about saying voluntary but mandatory. Are you in a situation where there is a choice, where you're given a choice but you don't really have a choice? That could happen with health insurance, for example. All health insurance companies could come and say that we need this additional data about your dietary habits. And I have a friend who runs a fitness tracker business and they have an insurance product where someone gets a lower insurance premium because they perform certain activities, etc., etc., etc. Right? But does that mean that there's an increase in insurance cost for everybody else? So effectively, you create an environment where everything is voluntary, but because everyone's following it in the market, it becomes mandatory. Yeah. Right? And that's on the business side. We've seen it on the government side. Effectively, data sharing becomes mandatory then. Just and, and your account aggregator system, your uh, your 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 credit profiling and the data protection bill has vast exemptions for for public credit. Now that public credit could be health, it could be financial, it could be like China has a social credit system. I was about to say that. Yeah. So, so it's good. The yeah, question is, is it good? So when you have so much data flowing about, it then starts impacting how pe people do business. It's impacting the choices that consumers have, and that's where I think privacy is a competition concern. Yeah. I'm happy you agreed, Nidhi. Uh, there was this uh, question which we had on uh, uh, consent and multiplicity of consent. Now, here's the thing. We also have other grounds of processing personal data. The whole point with consent is not the only one. And the whole point, and then you have a lot of stakeholders too. And each of these stakeholders have a different business model. Each of these stakeholders have a different purpose to process it. And then how do you gather and give that consent and that free consent? Instead of long notices, there's another very acceptable way of how is this data being used just in time notices or how exactly or as long as as long as there is this appropriate information in a language say, that the child can understand it's provided. There is a level to which the transparency, the objective of transparency can be achieved. And as if that is achieved, I personally don't see that having said that there are other grounds too, there will actually be a problem in being open, being transparent, and having privacy and innovation going together in their competitive landscape. Yep. So that's it. Oh, I'm just wondering, maybe next time we should not even uh, think about any question. We should just start with the question from the public and the audience and start it because got, that's where the majority of the discussion is going. But nonetheless, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the fact is that they were contesting views. They were uh, aligning views. Uh, we started with the aspects of privacy, how it is a hindrance or not a hindrance, or it should be inherent aspect of innovation, going to the points of uh, openness, talking about consent, and finally taking a break towards the lunch, saying pizzas and food delivery apps and talking about the coffees, right? So I think that's a perfect way to conclude this discussion. If there's anything more you require, the panelists are around. We'll be more than happy to spend time. But thank you so much for listening to us and giving this opportunity. Thank you, panelists. Thank you.